Welcome to the Total Connector Show. My name is Kivan Davani. Um, my very special guest is Janine. Um, Janine, thanks so much for your time. Um, last time we, we saw each other, or first time, <laughs> actually, was in Berlin at the Lightning Conference. So it was really great talking to you. And the things that you told me were just, you know, uh, you know. But anyway, so anyway, thank you so much for coming. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Um, I really did enjoy the Lightning Conference a lot. Um, so yeah, <laughs> met a lot of people there, um, both in the area and also from the U.S. and Europe as well. So it was a good meeting spot. Right, right. Um, and you know, the things that you told me were just, you know, uh, it was shocking and at the same time uh, hilarious. <laughs> You know the the experiences you had, or whatever encounter, uh, whatever you encountered in you know in in, in in previous times now. So listen, I mean, Jenny, you you you're pretty you know uh, very investigatively um, reporting on a lot of stuff, uh, especially on stuff that you know mainstream media definitely, but even other journalists. Uh, whom you would expect to report on don't really you know report so what i want to start with off with is uh the julian assange case can you like uh, you know from your perspective give you a recap like what's been going on and what what, what could be the implications if, if it goes on like that what's the situation right now with julian assange thank you um so there's there's actually multiple cases going on related to him. There's the case in the UK, which is the the biggest one, which is where he's fighting extradition to the United States um, from the UK, where he's been since 2010. Um, originally, he was detained and imprisoned under the uh, under the idea that he was going to be extradited to Sweden um, but that case has really fallen through and turned out to be mostly a distraction from the U.S. extradition case, which has been building up over a decade now. Um, the Swedish case has been opened and closed now uh, three times, um, on, involving four different prosecutors, uh, which uh, in, an, in itself should be a red flag that something went seriously wrong with that. And uh, the times that it was open and closed were very politically interesting in terms of the effect that it had on the media and what they chose to focus on over other things that were arguably more important. Um, the uh, So now it's basically down to the UK, um, the case in the UK and whether he will be extradited to the US um, based on the indictment that was released uh, sometime around, well, it was, I think it was released publicly sometime in April or May, but um, it was actually signed and put forth in March of this year. Um, then there's also the case with Ecuador, because um, up until this year, um, Assange was, uh, he had a refugee status and had sought asylum with the Ecuadorian uh, government um, at the embassy in London, and the circumstances and circumstances under which he was kicked out are very, very strange and um, highly politically motivated because we've been finding out since then that um, one or more security companies that the Ecuadorian government had been using to quote uh, provide security for the embassy um, have actually been passing along surveillance footage and audio and also paperwork materials that they stole from guests and Assange himself. Um, they've provided all of that, not only to the U.S. government as part of the extradition case, but they passed it along directly um, in terms of the audio and video to the CIA for at least a year, if not more. I think it was actually two years. So, yeah, pretty, pretty crazy. Um, there's not too much that's going to be happening in terms of the... Uh, case schedule until February of 2020, because that's when the um, extradition, the the real extradition hearings take place, where it's you know something actually happening and not just procedural stuff. But um, until then, there's going to be a lot of uh, 
basically bringing him into court uh, just to establish dates and arguments and everything. And we've been noticing um, that every time he's actually appeared in court, he's gotten worse and worse because he's, for some reason, he's been put into a high security prison called Belmarsh, which is reserved in the UK for like the top criminals in the country, including um, terrorists, or accused terrorists, um, all of that, which is extremely strange because um, under normal conditions, a person who, because um, his status was changed in, I think, October from um, someone who was imprisoned on uh, for breach of bail, which is what he was accused of um, in the UK, his status changed to someone who is basically awaiting extradition or at least extradition trial, um, which normally if you're that kind of person, but you're not being accused in the country of any serious violent offense, you're just put into a normal level prison. But for some reason, well, not for some reason, um, they're keeping him in a high security prison because that enables them to implement really strict uh, policies about um, what he's allowed to do, how he's moved around the prison, which so far we've seen that he's been isolated for most of the day, I think up to 23 hours per day. Um, and then when, whenever he's moved, the entire prison is on lockdown and he gets, I think, two, two visits a week or not two, two visits a month, actually. And those visits do not include, like, there's no extra visits for lawyers. So he basically has to choose or someone has to choose every month whether he prioritizes those visits for lawyers or for friends. So it's really sad. Wow. I mean, so the procedures seem to be totally arbitrary. I mean, it sounds like he's like under a, crim a military criminal tribunal, or, you know, I mean, it's, it's this is... Uh, how is his health situation? I mean, uh, is it true that he's being medicated, like, in a really bad way? Um, I don't know about medication. Um, I mean, I there there has been some suspicion that he's being drugged due to how quickly some of his symptoms that he was already exhibiting when he went into Belmarsh have accelerated, um, like anxious behavior, not really being able to focus, um, having trouble speaking. But uh, those symptoms could also just be a result of being isolated in solitary confinement for so long, um, which he was already, he was already somewhat under those conditions when he was still in the Ecuadorian embassy like the last year or so, because um, with the change in uh, government in Ecuador, um, they were not really as friendly to him as the previous president and government were. So um, a, a, as a baseline, I think it's most likely that his symptoms, and according to you know his doctors and also the um, United Nations um, guy who focuses on uh, victims of torture and stuff, um, most likely it's just symptoms of you know, being put into solitary confinement, which they consider to be torture um, at the number of hours that he's spending in solitary confinement is considered torture by the UN. So it's entirely possible that they could be medicating him as well, but um, it could just as easily be symptoms of um, being tortured in the ways that he has. This is this is just insane. I mean, how realistic is it that you know? First of all, is, do you think? I mean, from your analysis, do you think it, it's it's really possible Julian Assange could be extradited? I mean, this, is this possible? Is this really um, I don't I don't know. It uh, well, one of the interesting things that's happened in the last month or so, um, especially, is that the main judge um, who is responsible for overseeing the case, and um, I can't remember which which hearing she presided over, because there's been a few judges now. Um, but I think since September or so, I think actually a bit earlier than that, um, there's actually been a different uh, woman judge who's been. Um, presiding over the case, but the uh, prior judge who was actually originally assigned, um, she's a interesting character because, uh, uh, let's say, I think it was last February um, when I think his defense team was applying to have the 
uh, arrest warrant for the violation of bail removed because they said the Swedish case is now closed. There's no reason to have this arrest warrant when the reason for it being issued in the first place is now gone. And um, they said that the reason that Assange has still not left the Ecuadorian embassy is because he fears extradition to the United States. Now that was last February. And in response to that request, this judge who is now still the primary judge on the case um, she, her response was that his fears of extradition were not uh, reasonable, <laughs> which is funny because if you now go to a year and a half later, she is literally uh, involved in the extradition hearings to the United States. Um, she also has a ton of familial conflicts of interest because her husband uh, has worked for various firms that are have very strong relations or directly hire um, or are run by people from, for example, MI6, which is the intelligence agency in the UK. Um, her son is, uh, well, he, worked, he used to work at, um, I think it was an American company, and they had a very strong um, anti-WikiLeaks bent. And I think since 2016, He's been working at a different company that has a $50 million investment in a, another company called Dark Trace, which has the explicit goal of, you know, noticing behavior changes in a company's employees and finding like who might be, they call it like the malicious insider, but it's really like finding the whistleblowers before they can actually whistleblow on their company. Um, so the fact that her son has been doing that kind of work for um, almost a decade now, that's, that, that's considered a conflict of interest. Um, and some people might say, well, if it's not, if she's not directly doing that kind of work, why does it matter what her husband and son are doing? This but is actually crazy. that does matter. Because, I mean, come on. I mean, yeah. this, is, this is like such a rotten, corrupt judicial system. I mean, come on. I mean, it's the slightest suspicion that somebody is like in any shape or form through family, uh, whatever, or, 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 or husband or, or, or children. I mean, is, is this, is this, I mean, this is, this is crazy. How, how can this be? I mean, this she should be automatically an exclusion uh, rule, you know? Yeah. So that's what everyone else thought too, because actually um, last year, this judge was presiding over another case, a different case that was uh, about Uber. And she recused herself from that case because her husband was working for a firm that was an advisor to an Uber investor. Incredible. Like that's like two steps removed. And she still recused herself. Um, and so his, not a lot of this hasn't, like a lot of people haven't been paying attention to that, but his defense team, Assange's defense team, um, knew about this like months ago. They had noticed these connections. And so they had actually, um, they actually told one of the judges, Judge Snow, sorry, doorbell. Um, he, uh, his defense team had told the judge, uh, one of the judges, Judge Snow, that, you know, there's some conflicts of interest here. We need to resolve these. It wouldn't be appropriate for this, um, this judge to be presiding over this case if she has these conflicts of interest. And Judge Snow's response, which was very widely shared, um, he basically accused Assange of being a narcissist um, and that it was impolite or improper for them to question the, uh, the, I don't know, the, um, the, uh, what's the right word? Uh, it questioned her impartiality, basically, which is just amazing because, uh, that's that's the whole that's a whole dance that you have to go through like if you don't have an impartial judge that stuff needs to be raised early on or you're going to have a major problem if you have to change judges later on because you realize there's too many issues so it's very obvious that there's um some special treatment going on here where you know they're not they're not looking as closely or they don't care as much about these conflicts of interest and in fact they might have chosen this judge on that basis knowing that she had all of this bias and it was more likely that she would um at least from the intelligence community's perspective it's more likely that she would bring about a decision that was in their favor 
which should that should enrage people like even the people who don't like Assange or don't care about him specifically the idea that this could happen in the supposed democracy or uh, uh, <laughs> constitutional monarchy um, that that should be unacceptable to people okay wow this is incredible so uh, i mean i'm not an expert on this judicial sit but but i mean is it in any shape or for possible to you know to to have this question of you know whether the the judge is biased or impartial partial uh, like to delegate this to a higher court or you know to a uh, like a higher instance of a court is that in any is that possible or or, or do they have to, like to go through this process and then see what's happen what's going to happen how do you see this evolving um i don't know if they can i don't know what because i'm not as familiar with the uk justice system um compared to others but i don't know if they can necess like i don't know what their options are to challenge that now um but they can certainly when any kind of decision is made they can appeal that decision um and the one thing that everyone knows they're going to do is they're going to take uh whatever decision is made um and they're probably already in contact with the european court of human rights which even though the uk is technically as far as we know it's on course to leave the european union the european court of human rights actually still applies regardless of whether the uk stays or leaves um, so they still have that mechanism to call to, which they have been doing. They did that also with the previous case involving Sweden. Um, so they have that option available to them. Whether the UK will listen <laughs> uh, is another question, because um, in, in 2015, there was a whole investigation by the, the United Nations uh, Working Group and Arbitrary Detention um, on this case, and whether uh, the UK, Sweden... Um, mostly the UK, Sweden, but also tangentially the US were involved in basically a concerted effort to um, violate his human rights to, in their words, arbitrarily detain him, which means, you know, it's uh, there. there's some political motive there. It's not just a detention on the basis that you believe there's a credible crime or anything. Um, and that result was released in February 2016. And the UN said that not only should Assange be free to go, but he is owed compensation from the government of the UK and Sweden. Um, and now that the US is more involved, uh, eventually maybe they'll reissue a new decision and say that the US is owing him something too. Um, so, and, and basically what happened is the UK, even though they had, an, they had a chance to appeal that decision and say, you know, we disagree that he's being arbitrarily detained. Neither the UK nor Sweden decided to appeal, even though they could have. And both of them, to this day, um, have ignored that UN decision. So whether the UK will actually um, listen to any, or at least this at this stage, if any of these courts, the lower courts, are going to listen uh, to an international body or you know, feel strongly enough that this should go to a higher court, that's uh, up for debate because it seems at the moment that the UK justice system is completely out of whack. Oh yeah, there's no words for that. So um, so that in the 10 minutes we still have, like, I know you don't have much time and it's a shame on Berlin, they don't, they don't have, you know, a, a good internet connection because, uh, but I, I hear you pretty clearly. So, uh, um, uh, maybe we can we can uh, you know um, repeat this interview uh, next time also more comprehensively more detail because I want to talk to you about investigative journalism. What, what do you think is going to happen into you know to the world of journalism, investigative journalism uh, um, in general? Just w w what's your what's your perspective? What's the effect do you think in if this process goes on as it seems it's going on? Um, well, so one of the things that I talked about at the lighting conference regarding my talk was that, well, I didn't mention this specifically, but I've mentioned it a number of times elsewhere, which is that I think journalists should um, take the financial system, the economic system that they rely on more seriously, 
because um, to use WikiLeaks as an example, which I did in my talk, um, they would not have, I don't think they would have been able to survive as long as they have if they hadn't started using Bitcoin in, I believe it was mid 2011. I think that's when they started accepting it. Um, they were going to accept it a lot earlier, but um, according to Bitcoin talk threads, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto was uh, afraid that the uh, attention that WikiLeaks would bring on Bitcoin at that point would be dangerous. And some people still think that the attention that WikiLeaks brings to Bitcoin is dangerous. Uh, and yet here we both are, or here they both are um, doing fine. Um, but yeah, if WikiLeaks hadn't made that decision to start accepting Bitcoin, I don't know if they would have kept surviving because all of the financial system applications or institutions that they were relying on up until that point basically cut them off entirely. And I think still to this day, the only way um, or one of the few ways that you can donate to WikiLeaks using some of those um, financial institutions is actually through donation channels to other organizations that are less likely to be shut down for political reasons like that. Um, but definitely WikiLeaks has benefited a lot from using Bitcoin as a censorship resistant way to fund their um, organization through donations. So, um, and I think that if if journalists ever want to be able to challenge the status quo and report on things like war crimes in the future, they're going to have to go down a similar route because it's going to get increasingly hard, um, especially with uh, countries like the US and China increasingly um, controlling or having influence over large portions of internet infrastructure, um, especially in terms of media infrastructure and um, data storage and things like that. They're, they're going to have to look more closely at what kinds of infrastructure they're they're using and how it can be shut down and money is one of the most vulnerable in that sense because the US has a lot of uh, financial influence in the global uh, space are there uh, I mean I'm surprised that uh, or do you think there there are there aren't already uh, you know a number of journalists or you know whistleblowers or you know some kind of uh, structures that are already um, you know, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, 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 what do you call it? Getting compensated or, or somehow getting payments in in Bitcoin? Um, um, or do you think that's do you think it's evolving right now with more and more journalists, or whistleblowers, insiders, or institutions like WikiLeaks projects? Um. Well, so coincidentally, um, it was like a week or so before the Lightning Conference, um, I'd actually missed it, but there was an organization called the Hong Kong Free Press, and they've been sharing a lot of information about what's been going on in Hong Kong, um, the protests going on there, and some of their reporting is not looked on favorably by uh, the Chinese government. And uh, what, I don't know whether the Chinese government had an influence in this, but coincidentally, BitPay stopped processing their donations. Um, I think that was last, last early last month, um, they stopped doing that or maybe a bit before that. And they started accepting Bitcoin uh, through BTC pay server because, you know, even though they were accepting Bitcoin already, they were doing it through a payment processor that was centralized and could also, you know, whether it was a politically motivated action that their processing stopped working, um, there's a number of things that could go wrong there and could, you know, impact their funding on a very, uh, at a very critical time um, with not a lot of options to replace it. So uh, that's, that's one example. Um, I don't actually see that many journalists yet who are accepting Bitcoin consistently. Um, there are ones, obviously, like a lot of crypto media outlets, I think, offer that to their uh, writers like I know Aaron Verdum accepts I don't know if he, uh, he he he's been living on Bitcoin I don't know if he gets Bitcoin uh, from Bitcoin magazine but they, that he lives on it so I assume that that might be an arrangement um, but I think the biggest problem is that up until recently there hasn't been a lot of tools that are easy to use uh, by journalists because uh, one of the biggest problems is that um, even tech journalists are not actually that technically literate 
And so they struggle to use some of the tools that other people might be able to set up for themselves and self-host. So I think that's getting a lot easier though. For example, there's a Libra patron, um, which is a Patreon alternative that you, I think it, that also works with BTC pay server and it works very similarly to Patreon and you actually get a lot more options in terms of features um, because uh, you're not relying on Patreon to define, you know, what your page looks like or what it can look like. You can customize it yourself. Um, so I think part of it is just awareness that, that there are some tools that exist and a lot of journalists don't, uh, they're not aware of them. And I think there's also an awareness problem in terms of a lot of journalists uh, currently they're, if they're independent, they're struggling, um, but they generally tend to use things like Patreon and PayPal. Um, but the ones that are in media organizations, they don't see how easily they could be shut down because a lot of them at the end of the day are not, whether, whether they want to or not, they're not writing very uh, controversial things. And so they don't, uh, they haven't had an opportunity to be targeted in the same way. Um, but I think that if they did, if they ever tried, they would realize that um, a lot of what they rely on isn't going to work if they want to, you know, speak truth to power. Um, so there's a lot of different aspects there. Right, right. So, yeah, I mean, as I see, this is, um, it's going to be, I think it's going to be more and more extreme, this this sort of uh, two worlds of, or, you know, breakaway civilization. <laughs> Uh, with more and more decentralization going on and, you know, the technology is evolving at a rapid pace. So I'm just hoping and wishing that this is uh, really, it seems to be like a, you know, like a, like a competition, like a race, uh, you know, either freedom or, I don't know, dictatorship or criminality beyond imagination. So this is what what I'm observing right now. It's pretty getting getting pretty extreme. Do you have the the same perception? I mean, is that perception? Is, can you? What what's your take on that? I mean, um, I mean, I do think a lot of them are slowly waking up to it. Um, they're they're mostly waking up to it in the sense that um, because a lot of them obviously rely on um, surveillance and advertising uh, as their funding model, and that model has been increasing, like there's been an increasing number of holes in that where, you know, people are getting demonetized for not very good reasons. Like they, they said a, key, a keyword or something and that apparently makes their video unmonetizable to the advertisers, which is uh, ridiculous. But at the end of the day, that's how the system has always worked. And the advertisers are just realizing now that they have a ton of power about who, like who gets to talk and who gets to hear them. Um, and, you know, they're raging about that, but at the end of the day, that that's, I, I've always hated that system and I've tried very hard to never rely on advertising money and to steer people away from relying on advertising money as a source of income because it's not sustainable. And I think the incentives are kind of skewed, which is another thing I talked about in my talk um, about, I, I think I said something like you're, you're basically, you're basically encouraging your readers to go to someone else's website and buy a product instead of spending time reading your investigation. Um, that's what you basically right. end up doing when you have advertising enabled, like the advertiser wins if they spend less time on your, on your reading, your writing, which seems like an absurd thing to do. Uh, yeah. so and didn't yeah. uh, YouTube just made an announcement? Like, like I don't know whether that is just an idea or a draft of a policy that you know that if there are YouTube channels that are not commercial viable, they're gonna just shut it down in the next few months. Is that true? Or something like that. Um, I I haven't seen that, but if they did say that, that that wouldn't surprise me because um, I can't remember how long it's been around, but I think at least the past two years or so they've had YouTube Red, which is basically the more closed like subscription on paying subscriber only youtube um and yeah i mean there's a ton of, like there's a ton of that's another reason why they also got rid of um multi-person live streaming because now you can only live stream with i think one one source um and it used to be you could just use hangouts um they disabled that earlier in the year um 
and all of the, all, that just tells me that they're, you know, they, they, <laughs> even though it's Google, Google has a ton of data center space and everything. Um, they also have a ton of money. So it's not like they're necessarily <laughs> in the red or anything, but they're definitely shifting away from the more open, anyone can upload anything kind of YouTube that I remember from 10 years ago. Um, so yeah, I, I, I expect that there's going to be more alternatives to YouTube coming um, in the next couple of years because they're increasingly it's just not possible for a lot of people to share their content on YouTube, whether it's monetized or not. And actually, YouTube tends to uh, tends to rank videos that are not monetized lower because they're not making any mo money off of it. The advertisers aren't making any money. Um, so they have no incentive to, you know, populate that into people's feeds if they're not making money. Um, so th that doesn't surprise me at all. I feel like, I mean, Go Google's whole uh, whole apparatus is, there's so many people that rely on Google infrastructure for so many things. The, the number of times that I have to explain to people that there's alternatives to something like Google Maps or Google Drive or Gmail or whatever. It's like amazing how many people um, use Google for everything and they're not even aware of the alternatives because well, Google doesn't want to make you aware of the alternatives, but I think a lot of people just also don't go looking for them. Yeah, I guess it's a lot of, you know, it has to do with convenience or, you know, to, to the people are too are already too comfortable to, you know, uh, it's a sort of a trade-off for them. Like, and... Yeah, you know, and they they have to take action, and then I don't know. It's I hope I hope this is I, I hope more and more decentralized, censorship resistant, you know, f f um, uh, fair and ethical um, uh, platforms are gonna emerge out of this. So yeah, now let's talk about this maybe next time. Uh, Janine is really fascinating. Your insights and your you know investigative uh, ca capabilities and skills. It's it's amazing. So. Um, yeah, so hope to talk to you soon. Let's schedule maybe a new interview uh, in the next few weeks or, or or something like that when you have better bandwidth. I know you're in Berlin and it's, it's a little bit, yeah, it's a little bit crazy um, uh, with the bandwidth connection. Uh, but anyway, I appreciate your, your insights and sharing with me and my listeners, my viewers, um, your knowledge. Yeah, thank you. I'm happy to continue this and other topics another time. Yeah, keep up your, your great work, Janine. All right. Have a good day, all right? Thank you. Talk to you soon. Good weekend. Bye-bye. You, you too. Bye. Bye. Ciao.